It's time for us to begin. I have several announcements at the close of the service, but uh, this morning as we begin our worship service, our singing will be led by Brother Kelly Sims. Song number 396 will be our first song. Our opening prayer by Jeff Sparks. Mark Howell will bring the lesson. The Lord's Supper will be headed by Mike Wolf, And then our closing prayer by Ronnie Brown. Let us pray together. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessing that we have to be able to speak to you and to address you with our thoughts and our prayers and our needs. We thank you that you have opened up that pathway. The individual Christians now have that. We thank you so much for seeing that your word got passed down, that we now have the Bible and that we can study it and we can understand the gospel and we know that our souls can be saved. Father, we pray this individual congregation that you'll be with those that are in need of our prayers. Uh, Specifically, we pray now for uh, our brother Ronnie Mulnax as he's battling the the terrible virus, and we pray that uh, he might be restored to a portion of his life and that his health, and that he might survive well this uh, terrible disease. We thank you for answering our prayers on on uh, our behalf for others in this congregation who have struggled with this and continue to bless all who are dealing with this uh, virus at this time. Father, I also pray that you'll be with those who are uh, suffering from cancer. Uh, pray that you'll be with uh, Rhonda Smith of the parish congregation as uh, currently she is undergoing uh, cancer, has a cancer diagnosis. Pray that you'll be with all those who have lost loved ones, uh, uh, particularly at this time, a uh, family of our brother Joe Bonner, and pray that you'll be with Tanner and his other family members as they uh, struggle with his loss. Also, the family of Ryan Knight uh, was uh, killed in a traffic accident, and uh, also Libby Littleton. Uh, who passed away, and you pray that you'll provide comfort as as you can to those families during those extreme times. Father, we thank you for the eldership and the uh, leadership that they provide to this congregation. We pray that you'll continue to bless them with wisdom, that they may apply their knowledge to the leadership of this church, and that good things might come out of Midway. Uh, many things, including uh, the work in Romania as it is ongoing and uh, seems to be doing very well. Uh, Thank you so much for those that work with us, uh, Mark and and Marlene and Kelly and Caitlin and others that that care about the the day-to-day operations of the church. We pray that uh, this afternoon as we have a, a secular a fellowship that uh, that it might be carried out safely, and uh, and be able to be a blessing to those who are able uh, to uh, attend it. Um, Father, we pray that you will be with the leaders of this nation, and we pray that at some point our leadership might uh, come together, that we might again be a uh, one nation under God, and that uh, uh, there not be so much strife within the uh, various entities of uh, politics at this time. Father, uh, we thank you most of all for your Son who who gives us the ability to pray through him to you, and we thank you for his sacrifice for us, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No.
Good morning and welcome. We're so glad you're here. We have a good number here today. We have guests and we are thankful for that. And we want you to know that you're welcome here at Midway at any opportunity that you might have. As we begin our lesson this morning, I know that all of us do this, but we really and truly need to have some discernment about the things that we hear. For example, back in the days of Abraham Lincoln, when the Emancipation Proclamation was being debated, there was some intense debate between Abraham Lincoln and one of his, uh, I guess we could say, opponents. And as they were talking, Lincoln said to him, he asked him, he said, how many legs does a calf have? Well, the man looked at him with sort of a disgusted look on his face. He says, well, four. And Lincoln says, well, if I said that his tail was a leg, then how many legs would he have? And the guy looked back at him and said, well, he'd have five. And Lincoln said, no, that's where you're wrong. Calling a tail a leg does not make it a leg. We have to have some discernment. You know, when it comes to social media and things like that, a lot of folks today don't have a whole lot of discernment. Now, I don't know if you've uh, seen some of the things that I've seen on Facebook, but uh, I'm not going to call any names today because I might incriminate some here. And, And I'm not saying that I've seen your name, but... But we're just going to call this Facebook user here gullible Facebook user, okay? And so somebody runs across this, uh, this statement. It talks about how, you know, I found this picture outside Walmart. It had mom and dad, 1955. And I know somebody has lost this, and I know it must be important to them. And so I'd really love to get it back to them. And they share this picture that's found here. You know, I've seen this several times on Facebook. Some of you are shaking your head. I don't know if you shared it or just saw it. But people share it. That thing, it gets a thousand and one comments and a million and one shares. And everybody's trying to find mom and dad from, or at least the one who had the picture, you know, and lost it outside of Facebook. But I'm going to tell you, I know who it is. And so if you want to send it back to them, it's okay. You see, it's, uh, it's uh, the, two, the couple from uh, Back to the Future. You know, when Marty McFly went back to the future, it's George and Lorraine McFly. You know, sometimes we can't believe everything we see or everything we hear. We have to have some discernment in the way that we do things and the way that we think about things in our life. And so, when it comes to that idea this morning, I want you to think about it with me, and let's spend some time dealing with that and trying to understand why it's important that we need to have this discernment, how it is that we can't believe or don't need to believe everything we hear. Now, there's a great Bible story. If you remember, over the past several weeks, we've been looking at great Bible stories and trying to find some principles from them that we can teach our children as they're growing up so that they'll have these principles to guide them in their life. But there is a great Bible story that illustrates what we're talking about today. For us to get into the story, what I want us to do to begin with is look at some background material to what is about to happen. So if you have your Bible, you may want to turn to the book of 1 Kings chapter 12, And let's read simply verses 26 through 31 together. 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 26 through 31. There the Bible says, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If this people go up and offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam king of Judah. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold, and he said to the people, You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Then this thing became a sin, for the people went as far as Dan to be before one. He also made temples on high places and appointed priests from among the people who were not of the Levites. Now this is going to be the setting of the story. I don't know if you remember when uh, King Solomon died, 
After his death, we have the kingdom being split into two. We have two men. One, their names are very uh, similar. One by the name of Rehoboam and the other by the name of Jeroboam. And part of the people went with Jeroboam and part of the people went with Rehoboam. Rehoboam stayed in Judah and in uh, also the tribe of Benjamin and, and they comprised what came to be known as the southern kingdom. But Judah, or rather uh, Jeroboam and the remainder of the tribes of Israel, they, they all banded together and, and formed what we call the, the northern kingdom. But the northern kingdom from the very beginning started going astray because Jeroboam led the people astray and what he did in, in doing that was set up these calves. But what I want us to understand that Jeroboam in altering God's religion had committed a very grievous sin. God, God did not uh, approve of that in any way. He had said in his Ten Commandment law not to have an idol, not to put any God before him. But that's exactly what Jeremiah, or rather Jeroboam, was doing to the people and causing the people to do. And and so he had had sinned. We read in this reading that we just got finished with how that it had become a sin, but it was a very grievous sin in the eyes of God. He had changed the place of worship. He had changed what they worshipped and had set up these idols. Now in response to that, God appears to a young prophet. We're just going to call him a young prophet because he is never named in Scripture. And so we're going to call him a young prophet. And again, let's go back to the book of 1 Kings. And now let's go to chapter 13, the next chapter, and let's look together at verses 1 through 10. 1 Kings chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. The Bible says, And behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings. And the man cried against the altar uh, by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priest of the high places who make offerings on you. And human bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. And when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar of, uh, at Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him! And his hand, which he stretched out, against him dried up so that he could not draw it back to himself. The altar also was torn down and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. As we look at this, we, we see all of this happening. We, we have this offering being made. We have the king, Jeroboam. We have this prophet of God going up and we have him prophesying against Jeroboam and this altar. We have Jeroboam trying to reach out and grab him. We have God miraculously saving this young prophet by causing Jeroboam's hand to dry up so that he can't move it, he can't draw it back. We have all of that going on. Continuing in uh, 1 Kings chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, The Bible said, And the king said to the man of God, Entreat now the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. And the man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and became as it was before. Now now the prophet, get the picture here, the prophet had cried out against the altar and what was going on. The king wanted to seize him. His hand was afflicted. And now he changes his uh, uh, way of t- saying things. He, he changes his mind about things. He says, talk to God for me. Ask God, plead with God to fix my hand for me. And so that's exactly what uh, the young prophet does. But again, continuing on in verse uh, uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, the Bible says, And the king said to the man of God, Come home with me 
and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. The man of God said to the king, If you give me half your house, I will not go with you. I will not eat bread or drink water in this place, for it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor return by the way that you came. So he went away and did not return by the way that he came to Bethel. Now again, as, we, as we're seeing the setting, as we're getting the picture here, we have the king, we have all of the events that surround it. His hand uh, becomes uh, dried up. We see it restored when the young prophet asked God to restore it. And now he wants to invite him home with him. And he wants to have him there and he wants to reward him according to what we read here in this passage. But when we see what the, <coughs> what the young prophet says to him, he said, God gave me some commands. Now, what were the commands? He said, don't eat bread and water and don't go back home by the same way that you came. Those were the commands that he was given. Now, may I ask you a question this morning? What was hard to understand about that? Was there anything hard to understand about the commands that God gave to this young prophet? Don't eat water, or don't eat bread, and don't drink water, and don't go home the same road you came on. Is there anything hard? You see, when we're talking about the commandments of God here, we understand that God's commands were clear, concise, and easy to follow. It wasn't anything difficult for this young man to do. And God made it very clear that he was to to do it this way. You know, God's commands are still like that. In 1 John chapter 5, at verse number 3, the Bible says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. God's commands are not burdensome. The word burdensome means oppressive, difficult to observe. Now, this could be translated, and it wouldn't do any harm to the text whatsoever, by saying simply, it is not difficult to do what God has commanded. That's the idea that is presented here. And so, the commands had been given to this young prophet. The young prophet had reiterated these commands to Jeroboam so that he could hear them, and he made it clear that he was not, he was not going to disobey the commands of God. And so what we find here is this young prophet seems to be quite a superb example of a faithful man of God. Would you agree with that? Here is a man who goes and he prophesies against the altar as God had told him to do. And and when someone comes to him and says, you know what, you're right, I need to change, just come on home with me. And when the king invites him home, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a big deal. This young prophet, he was going to stand for God no matter what. The king had said, see, he had risked his own life in coming and doing what God had told him to do. God had miraculously protected him. And now this young man says, I'm going to do. You see, he was determined. The young prophet was determined to follow what God said, and he could not be persuaded to turn from it. Not even when the king himself tried to get him to go home with him. He would not uh, uh, do that. He, he could have said, you know, well, you know, this king here, he, he seems to be somewhat receptive. And if I go home and I spend just a little bit of time with him, maybe I can persuade him to, to get everything fixed, to, to get it all you know, worked out, to, to turn completely back to God. He could have reasoned in his mind and said, you know, maybe I can be a good influence on this king. But this young prophet, he didn't do that. He wouldn't even accept a reward. Do you remember when we were reading there 
that when the king invited him to come home, he, he offered him a reward. He said, come home with me and I'll give you a reward. He wouldn't even, this young prophet wouldn't even receive a reward from the king for coming and helping him understand what he was doing was wrong. He wouldn't do that. You see, he wasn't like Balaam. Balaam was a man who, who wanted a reward. In the book of first, Second Peter, rather, chapter 2, at verse number 15, the Bible says, Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. Now, what was the wrongdoing that Balaam had done? Well, God had told him not to prophesy against the uh, children of Israel. You can't, you can't follow what the Moabites said and go against my people. But they offered him a reward. In Numbers chapter 22 at verse number 12, God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. That's the Moabites. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. That's the Israelites. Now that's not hard to understand either, is it? When he told him that, but... But when they come and they, they ask him that uh, he would do that, uh, look at uh, Numbers chapter 22, verses 17 through 19. For I will surely do you great honor. This is what the king says to, to, to Balaam. I'll surely do you great honor, and whatever you say to me, I'll do. Come curse the people for me. Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go against the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. So you too, please stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. Now when, when, when King Balak offered him some money, when he offered to pay him, he said, mm, I know what the Lord said and, 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 and I know that it was easy for me to understand but man, now all of this money's at stake. If you'll just hang around for tonight, I'll see if the Lord's got anything else to add to it. We'll, we'll just see about that. This young prophet that we're talking about today, he wasn't even interested. He didn't want to hang around. He knew what God had said, and he was determined to do what God said. He couldn't even be bribed to go and stay home or stay at the home of the king. And so we have a man who seems to be a superb example of a faithful man of God who seemed to be determined to do what was right, what God had told him to do. But there's the rest of the story. The rest of the story that we need to see. He starts out noble. He starts out doing just what he should do. But though he starts out nobly, I want you to know this morning that this story is one of the saddest stories in all of the Bible. Starts out well, but we come to one of the saddest stories in all of the Bible. All we need to do is continue reading in the book of 1 Kings chapter 13. The Bible says, now an old prophet. Now remember, we're talking about a young prophet and we have an old prophet. And the Bible calls him an old prophet. Now an old prophet lived in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told to their father the words that he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, which way did he go? And his sons showed him the way that the man of God came from Judah and had gone. And he said to his son, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he mounted it. And he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with you or go with you, Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, You shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor there, nor shall nor return by the way that you came. Now I want you again to get 
this setting that we have this young man, the young prophet. He's sitting under a tree. An old prophet comes to him. He says, let's go home. Go home and eat with me. And what does the young prophet do? What does he do? You see, what the young prophet does is quote the word of God, right? You know, a lot of times when we talk about being tempted, we say that if we just have the Word of God in our heart, if we just are, know what the Word of God says, we point to Jesus who, when he was tempted by Satan, what did Jesus do? Well, he quoted the Word of God. What did this young prophet do? He quoted the Word of God. The clear, concise, easy-to-follow directions, commands that God had given him to follow. And he repeats them here to this old prophet, right? Am I right? Isn't that what he does? It's absolutely what he does. And he said to him, I also am a prophet as you are. This is the old prophet speaking back to the young prophet. I also am a prophet as you are, And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you into your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So he went back with him and ate bread and his house and drank water. Now, before we go any farther... What's so bad about eating a bite of food and drinking a little water? What's so bad about that? I mean, don't you have to eat? Don't you have to drink in order to live? What's so bad about... Is there anything bad about it? I guess I could probably ask it in that way. Is there anything bad about what this young prophet does when he goes back to the house? Well, the biggest problem is... He did exactly what God told him not to do. He did exactly what God told him not to do. Now, whose fault was it? Whose fault was it? Uh, Look back at what we... The man, the, the old prophet said, I'm a prophet. An angel spoke to me. The angel said for me to tell you to come home and eat and drink with me. But he lied. Now whose fault was it that this young man went back and ate with this old prophet? Whose fault was it? When you, when you think about it, consider again all that this young prophet had been able to accomplish. He had withstood the wrath of the king by the help of God. He had stir, stood firm against flattery from the king. He had shunned the lure of riches that could have been given to him by the king. He wasn't a bad man, but he had a brave character and a true soul. He had previously been absolutely faithful and loyal to God, right? Isn't that what we've seen this morning? The young prophet's downfall came when he was willing to believe a lie. The old prophet said, I'm a prophet. And the angel said to me, tell him to come home and eat with you. But he lied. I want you to compare that with what the young prophet said. Remember what he said? It was said to me by the word of the Lord. God had given him the command. And now the old prophet says, an angel said to me, the young prophet said, the Lord gave me the command, and the old prophet said, an angel said to me. In the book of Galatians chapter 1 at verse number 8, let's remind ourselves of what Paul wrote. He said, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, Let him be accursed. Though we are an angel from heaven, 
What did this old prophet say? An angel said, Are are there people who have great religious followings today who have gone astray from what we read in the Word of God because they say, An angel said to me, What about Muhammad? Muhammad has so many followers in our world today. It's called the Islam or uh, Muslim religion. But where did he say he got his information? An angel came and spoke to him and gave him what we know as the Quran. What about Joseph Smith? Joseph Smith has quite a number of followers in his church. Joseph Smith being the one who gave us what we know as the Book of Mormon. And he said, I got it from an angel. Paul said, if we or an angel from heaven say anything else to you other than what we said to you here, let that person be accursed. Don't follow after him. Let him be accursed. What did the young prophet do? He listened to this man because the man said, an angel told me to tell you. The man knew exactly what God had told him to do, but now... He is led on a disastrous road because he's willing to listen to the old prophet. You see, we can't believe everything we hear. We have to have some discernment. Continuing on in chapter 13, verses 20 through 22, the Bible says, And as they sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back, And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the command that the Lord your God commanded you, but have come back and have eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which he said uh, to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your body shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. This time God did speak through the old prophet. And when he spoke, he condemned the young prophet. If you continue on, verses 23 through 31, after he had eaten bread and drunk, he saddled the donkey for the prophet whom he had brought back, and he went away. A lion met him on the road and killed him. And his body was thrown in the road, and the donkey stood beside it. The lion also stood beside the body, and behold... Men passed by and saw the body thrown in the road and the lion standing by the body, and they came and told it to the city, uh, told it in the city where the old prophet lived. And when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard of it, he said, "It's the man of God who disobeyed the word of the Lord, and therefore the Lord has given him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him, according to the word that the Lord spoke to him." And he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. And they saddled it. And he went and found the body thrown in the road, the donkey and the lion standing beside the body. The lion had not eaten the body nor torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the body of the man and laid it on the donkey and he brought him back to the city to mourn and bury him. And he laid the body in his own grave. And they mourned over him saying, Alas, my brother, And after he had buried him, he said to his sons, When I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. What a sad story. What a sad, sad story. You know, it's pretty interesting, and the Bible makes a lot to do about it. A lion killed him, threw him off the donkey. The man's laying in the road. But now we've got a donkey standing by the body. Folks, what's usually going to happen when a lion encounters a donkey, as far as the donkey is concerned? He may not be able to outrun the lion. The lion may catch up with him. But I'm going to say the vast majority of the time, the donkey is going to run off because the donkey is afraid. What about as far as the lion is concerned? If the donkey's standing there, he's got a free meal. He's going to eat the donkey. 
But get the picture. The man is laying dead in the road and the donkey's standing there evidently looking at him and the lion's standing there evidently looking at him and they're ignoring each other. (laughs) He doesn't eat what he's killed. The lion doesn't. He doesn't go after the donkey to eat the donkey. The donkey doesn't run off. The Bible makes a lot to do out of that. Why does it do that? Simply this. It's God's hand that's involved in this. Not a random act. It's God's hand. And why was God's hand involved in this case? Because he told the young prophet, don't eat, don't drink, not even water, and don't go home the same way. But he believed a lie. And God told him, through the mouth of the prophet who had deceived him. This is what's going to happen to you. And it did. Somebody say, well, didn't didn't that old prophet, didn't he sin worse than the young prophet? You remember a minute ago I said, what's so bad about eating, eating some bread and drinking some water? Well, it's where God had told him not to eat it and drink it. It can't be real bad. It, it can't be as bad as lying to him. So why didn't God punish the old prophet rather than the young prophet? Because he lied. Well, I think the answer is this. The story is not about the old prophet. The story and the point of the story is about the young prophet. You see, the Bible is full of descriptors that tell us what's going to happen to all liars. In the book of Revelation 21 at verse number 8, if you read that passage, you know the Bible specifically says that all liars will have their portion in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. We know what's going to happen to liars. The point of the story is not what happens to liars. It is to impress on our minds the danger of believing a lie. That's the reason this young man, this young prophet, is the one who is punished here. We know what happens to liars. We teach that to our kids. We say, don't be a liar. Don't lie to me. Parents sometimes say, I can take a lot of things, but I can't take my kids lying to me. We all understand that. But how many times do we teach our children about believing a lie? That's the principle here, the point that God is making for us in this sad, sad story. Believing a thing to be true doesn't make it true. It's as simple as that. Just because we believe it to be true doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it right. The young prophet believed the lie that the old prophet told him, didn't he? Was he sincere about it? Absolutely. Did he go home? Yes, he went home with him. You know, suppose today that you're told that one church is just as good as another and you believed it. Would that make any difference? Yes, it would. We can't follow anything that we hear. You know what? The same thing that happened to the young prophet can happen to us today. I'm not talking about a lion throwing us off our donkey and the donkey and the lion standing there after we've been killed. I'm saying we can believe a lie. All kinds of lies are preached and followed today in the name of religion. One of these things... It is a test that, uh, to test what is said, we have to do that. That's what the noble Bereans did, Acts chapter 17, verse number 11. These Jews were no more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They wanted to know, am I believing a lie or am I believing the truth? In the book of 1 John, chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets 
have gone out into the world. We've got we to gotta check things out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, at verse 21, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. There's so much that's been taught in the name of religion today that is just absolutely wrong. But you know what? Should we be concerned about believing a lie about things that are not normally associated with religion? Should our children be concerned about believing a lie about things that are not normally associated with religion? You know, for some, if one political party says a thing, it's always right, and the other party says it, it's, it's got to be wrong, if they, even though they say the same thing. We get so caught up in these kinds of things. But, but even more frightening is how many buy a whole hog into the fallacious arguments in regard to political ideologies of our day. Let me give you an example. A Harris poll in 2019 asked this question. Do you agree with this statement? I prefer living in a socialist country. Do you agree with that statement? Again, the Harris Poll, big posting, uh, polling group in 2019, according to the poll, 49.6% of young Americans said yes. 61% of those 18 to 24 had a favorable, favorable reaction. 61%. What's so bad about it? An article in American Spectator by Lee Edwards summed socialism up well. This is the reality of social, socialism. A pseudo-religion grounded in pseudo-science and enforced by political tyranny. Socialism is a sibling to communism. And, and even though it may sound good that we want to make everybody on equal terms, everybody's level. Every time it's been tried, it's been a miserable failure. Do most people become equal? Yes. Equally miserable. Except for those who are on top, who have control. Oh, there's so much more in regard to that. What about this, though? We hear more and more that it's good for people to have the right to choose whether or not they're a boy or a girl. For 6,000 years, doctors have had no problem telling the difference. And suddenly, we got folks who want to, oh, I don't know which one I am. Somebody says, well, it's just not right to bind something on those who don't feel they're included or, or, or feel they would rather be something else. There was a story this past week, an AP story, came out on October the 28th, and it said this, the United States has issued its first passport with an ex-gender designation, marking a milestone in the recognition of the rights of people who do not identify as male or female and expects to be able to offer the option more broadly next year, the State Department said day. And that's touted as good. But our young people are being fed lies and they're being led down a path of destruction just like this young prophet. Add to that the calls for such things as defunding police or criminal justice reform, which is basically don't punish pr criminals. And yet the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse number 11, because the sentence against the evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Look at the places where they're trying this stuff and see how much crime is speeding up and increasing. 
And yet young people in particular are being fed this bunch of garbage and they're believing it. All these philosophies, plus many, many more, are both dangerous and devastating, not to mention downright despised God. And they're being spewed forth. And the ears of people, especially young people today, are bringing them in and embracing them because they want to believe what they hear. Sounds good. It sounded good to that young man that an angel told this old prophet, he said, you can come home and you can eat bread and you can drink water with me. And it cost him his life. Sad thing is that many young people are not being equipped today to distinguish the difference between truth and error, right and wrong. They listen to the lie. Like the young prophet, they believe the lie. In the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, listen to what the Bible says. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God will not intercede, step in and say, hey, you have got to believe the truth. He's not going to do that. That's not the way he operates. And you know what? It's left up to you and me to teach our children to be able to discern it. The responsibility of accepting what is truth and rejecting what is false falls on our shoulders. Don't believe everything you hear. That's a great Bible principle that we have to teach our children. It may be today that you need to respond to the gospel to put on your Lord in baptism. It may be that you need to come back to the Lord. Whatever the case may be, if we can assist you, come right now as we stand and sing. Breathe my heart, dear. It's now time for us to observe the Lord's Supper, which God has commanded us and given us the blessing to do so. So if you would, as I offer thanks for these 
emblems. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, as we come before you now to gather around this table, we thank you that, first of all, that you have sent your Son to this earth where he lived and died for us, lived a perfect life, died an agonizing death, so that we might be able to live with you someday. Thank you for this sacrifice that you made and the blessing that you gave us. Thank you for instituting this Lord's Supper where we can during the services that we can carry our minds back to that day when you performed that deed that would allow us to have remission of sins. Help us now as we go through this exercise. Thank you at this time for this bread which represents his body that was shed for us. May, I, may we partake of it in a way that be pleasing unto you, and we ask these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Would you bow with me now as I give thanks for the fruit of the vine? Heavenly Father, thank you for this fruit of the vine as it represents the blood of your Son shed for us. Help us to understand that through this blood is the only way that we can make contact with you and to associate with you. Help us to center our minds on these things. Help us to partake of this fruit of the vine that in, a, in a manner pleasing unto you. And we ask these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. As a matter of convenience, we can take this opportunity now to give back to God what he's so bountifully given to us. Would you also bow with me as I give thanks for what he's materially done for us. Heavenly Father, thank you especially for those spiritual blessings of life that you've given us. And we also realize, Heavenly Father, that everything we have has come from you and everything we have is yours. And now as we have opportunity to give a portion of that back to you so that others might enjoy the blessings that we, the children of yours, do, Help us to graciously and liberally give a portion of that back. And we ask these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. In just a moment, Brother Kelly will come and lead us in a closing song. Uh, following that song, Brother Ronnie Brown will lead us in our closing prayer. Be sure to pick up a bulletin.
a lot of useful and uh, current information that's in there. Uh, there's a table in the foyer where Joanne usually sits and takes roll as, we're, as you're coming in. We are updating the directory. We want to have this thing printed. It'll be part of our calendar for 2022. So if you've had a change of address or a change of phone numbers or uh, addition to the family, then uh, if you will, there's index cards out there. If you'll fill one of those out and put those inside that uh, little vase that's sitting right there next to it, then we'll uh, get that updated between now and it's time for us to order our uh, 22 calendars. So I think the only additional information that we had for the bulletin is remember Gail, Wheeler, uh, Gail Gillett was restored this past Wednesday night. And then also this afternoon from 3 o'clock until 5 o'clock. You know, I think there's uh, a lot of young people that's here, and I'm just about guessing that they have already tried out their Halloween costumes. So we look forward to seeing everyone here this afternoon at the Trunk or Treat slash Halloween event that we'll be having. It will take place in the lower half of the parking lot. So as you come in, if you are doing a car <clears throat> or games in the trunk or treat area, if you'll come in the lower parking lot down or by Dutton Hill down here and turn into the parking lot, somebody will be there to direct you uh, where to park so you can get everything set up. Remember, we want to start at 3 o'clock. And if you're just going to be coming in to enjoy the fellowship, then you're welcome to park in the rest of the parking lot up here, but we will have it divided off down there. Uh, hot dogs and corn dogs, chips and soft drinks will be provided. So we look forward to seeing everyone there this afternoon for that. So, Brother Kelly. I am thine, O Lord, I have... Bow with me, please. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, dear Lord, just thanking you for a glorious day you've given us, the sunshine, dear Lord, the brisk, cool air, the leaves changing, changing, dear Lord. We thank you for all that. We thank you, dear Lord, for all that you do, all that you do for us right now, all you've done in the past, and all that you're going to do for us in the future. We thank you for it, dear Lord. We thank you for Brother Mark, the great lesson we heard this morning. We thank you for Brother Kelly, dear Lord, as the wonderful singing he leads us in. We thank you, dear Lord, for our elders, our deacons, our Sunday school teachers. We thank you for the congregation here, dear Lord, at Midway. We ask you just to continue to bless us, dear Lord. We ask you, dear Lord, just to be with the millions of children that's out in the neighborhoods tonight, roaming the streets. We ask you, dear Lord, just to protect them, watch them, watch over them, and get them back safely tonight. And we thank you, dear Lord, for our country. We thank you... Uh, Dear Lord, for our military, we ask just to uh, be with us, dear Lord, and thank you for letting us live in the greatest nation on earth and the greatest part of the nation in the south, dear Lord. Just thank you for that. We thank you, dear Lord, for all that you do for us. We thank you, dear Lord, most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, who died that horrible, cruel death on the cross so that we, we may spend eternity with you one day. Just forgive us where we fail you and watch over us and lead us and guide us. In your name we pray. Amen.